Thank you so much for coming to this presentation. My name is Christina Curran. I worked in the Wu lab at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and I'm here to talk about my research concerning the mutation or co-mutation of RPS15 and TP53 and how they drive the B cell malignancy CLL. So I'd first like to review what CLL is. It's a leukemia or a um, cancer of the blood that primarily affects B cells, which are a type of lymphocyte. Um, it's a chronic disease, so it progresses more gradually than other types of cancers, and it primarily affects older adults. The average age of diagnosis is around 70 years old. The primary gene that we studied was RPS15. It's mutated in about 5% of patient samples. It has a 36% co-mutation event with TP53. Um, it is a ribosomal protein gene, and it um, makes the four, part of the 40S subunit. This mutation also occurs in about 19% of relapse cases, which is why it's believed to, um, its mutation is believed to increase the severity of CLL, and it's frequently clonal. The primary method of investigation that I used for um, this research was the mouse model. So these mice that we studied contained CD19, Cre recombinase induced RPS15, and in some cases TP53 mutations. Um, and these mice were used to monitor the impact of these mutations uh, over time, whether that be if they developed disease or how it impact, impacted their um, B cell pathways, etc. So in order to identify whether or not a mouse had CLL, um, there were two methods that we used. One was we looked at the size of the spleen. You can see on the left, there's a healthy mouse, which has a relatively small spleen. And on the right, we had a diseased mouse. Now, um, this spleen you can see is significantly larger, but this wasn't a um, sole determinant of disease and it couldn't particularly pinpoint CLL. Another, um, detail that we used was flow cytometry. So you can see on the left, um, this mouse has a good amount of B cells um, indicated by the high amount of B220 positive cells. Um, and you can see there aren't a lot of CD5 positive cells. However, on the right, you can see there's a lot of B220 positive CD5 positive cells here. So this would indicate that the mouse that was analyzed here had a significant portion of disease. This disease was confirmed through the uh, pathologies analysis of immunohistochemistry samples of these mice. Um, you can see we took a look at how the different groups developed RPS15 mutations. Um, the wild type mice did not develop cancer at all. That um, meant neither CLL nor other types of lymphomas. The mutant type mice with just RPS15 developed CLL in 12 cases of mice um, and other lymphomas in about two cases. Um, this, the mice that only have the TP53 mutation developed CLL in seven cases and none yet have developed other types of lymphomas. And you can see the double mutant mice here, um, some have CLL and some have developed other lymphomas, but one thing that you can notice is that they developed the disease much earlier than the RPS15 mice, which was an interesting finding. So the belief for how this drives CLL is that um, when you have a wild type RPS15 mouse, and assuming that it also is um, has TP53 functioning normally, the TP53 should be activated and tumor um, progression so it should be suppressed. But if you have a mutant type of RPS15, uh, TP53 and TP53 is not activated, this could cause DNA damage, um, which could lead to MYC activation, which is a known cancer pathway. And if you do not have um, TP53 dysregulation, there has been some findings from other colleagues in this lab that an increased ZAP70 activity is noticed in some of these RPS15 mutant mice, which could also lead to MYC activation, which is a known cancer pathway. So um, this was some of the work that I worked on in this lab, and I was really grateful to 
be able to be a part of this project.